2008. But when I came back, I asked them, and then I decided to form my own company. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Otis uh, with the Economic Group. I'm also uh, the executive of the quartet, the newest baby from the Economic Stable. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, <coughs> just to start off with um, Mr. Robert, I was doing a research about uh, how really we are and how things are about the PPO and outsourcing. And I came across an article which you were advocating about uh, the pure outsourcing here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want to know, how do you feel now, like five, six, seven years down? How do you feel now? Are we really ready? Uh, 
at a build stage. We need to move fast into that area because uh, when you service clients abroad, then you are sure that their data is going to be protected. So we need the uh, legislation and technology that assures the, the level of encryption that, that, that is secure. And we need also to have like a background checking system because any, any, sorry, any thug can, can become an agent. And if you're dealing with credit card numbers and people's social security numbers, you cannot allow anybody anywhere to access that kind of info. So I think on that part, uh, legislatively, we could do more uh, in, in terms of that. And then the other area, I think we spoke about training. And then there's one area that concerns, concerns me then, R&D. We, we don't seem to put much value in that, but of late cassava uh, and, and these bodies have, have, have come up to the party. R&D is important. This is why most of telcos in Africa are struggling, because they are playing the catch-up game. They, they don't research and stay ahead. I mean, last week, um, I mean, I, I came in last night uh, with this job at flight, but I survived, you know, the running. Um, I, I was attending a 5G testing uh, seminar. They are testing. So what I'm trying to say is the local companies, Net1, uh, Teleaccess, all companies that are there, they need to invest in research and development. Because all the companies I went through abroad, Intel and Google, they, they, they put a lot of money so that when things change, they are ready to move with the change. So those are things that are uh, quite of concern. But otherwise, those are the things that pretty much stand. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Um, yeah, I think it is important for us to um, invest in research and development. Um, uh, Mr. Linus, as we know you are from CPSF, which is like a regulation board, how, uh, from that perspective, are we really with? Because uh, we heard from uh, Mark Anderson, you were saying that there are certain things that need to be in place before we can actually start um, being and being in the international market. And one of the things you mentioned was having a board like CPSF. So how do you feel like, are we really ready? so much. Uh, I, I strongly feel that we are so much ready as a country to become a competing destination globally. Because looking at uh, from where we are seated as an association and the aspect that have been raised by Mark Angus, uh, some of them we are yet to maybe put them in place, but there are also other things that we have already done so well. So I, we are so ready. For example, we, in 2011, the association started in 2010. So in 2010 and slash 2011, we, it's very key for us to become a global competitive I mean, destination. If you also have maybe in-house contact centers where we can learn from also. Those can just come and set up a contact center to save international markets without also having your own in-house contact centers to have that learning you know, uh, curve. So for us in 2010-2011, we only had uh, three, three companies that had in-house contact centers and they were from the telecoms company only. And then if you had to move maybe fast forward right now, we have 36 companies with in-house contact centers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the banking sector, we have the insurance sectors that, that have joined the telecoms company as well. And if you had to look maybe at the service level agreements or the KPIs, KPIs into the in-house contact centers in Zimbabwe that we use maybe to measure. I think most of you maybe you can relate to that. So there are some improvements that, uh, that are so remarkable. But initially, you find that the service level agreement maybe in the contact center was less than 50% on average for the telecoms company. But right now, if you have to put the service level agreement for the entire sector, of course, it's skewed. I mean, there are some outliers where maybe the telecoms uh, is, uh, the companies, they are still at the bottom line. And we also have maybe the insurance sector doing so well out competing the other sectors and the banking sector of course to the lesser extent. So they are KPIs, they are so good. They're now above maybe average SLA maybe is around 65%. We also have the percentage answer rate, uh, which is also above uh, maybe 70%. So it's, it's, those are the KPIs that we also need to consider because we are talking about uh, 99, the five nines, eh? 99 percent in terms of the SLAs, the answer rate, obviously, you need to, to be ready to have almost 100% answer rate and stuff. So in, 
in our contact centers, I think they are doing so well and they have done so well. And if you have to look at our people in terms of the education and stuff and the, the labor force, uh, our market right now, if you are to check, every year we are churning out graduates and those graduates, uh, they don't have any job. So I think this is an, uh, an opportunity time for, for, as a nation, to really scale up, I mean, the, the BPO sector or BPO slash contact center, you know, sector, and also learn from those who have done so, like the Western Cap and uh, other destinations that have done so for maybe knowledge transfer and exchange of ideas. Uh, so we are so, so much uh, ready as a nation. So I think maybe I will just end here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and that I should mention KPIs and I was interested to know for Mr. Otis, since you have uh, recently launched the Auto Contact, um, do you really think that we're ready for the international market, considering that, um, like what Brianna was mentioning, that we're, we're at 65 years, but we're still not, we're still not at the highest, or at least at 80% of percentage uh, us rate. So how do you feel about us moving forward? Uh, are we really ready to be in the international market, given those KPIs? Thank you for that. Uh, thanks to, to Rob and uh, friends. I think from my perspective, uh, I would like to just start by saying that there's need for us to, to have a paradigm shift in terms of our mindsets. Uh, both as a individual, as a media stakeholders, and uh, as, as a country. Um, famous Chinese proverb,
Okay, because we've been talking about internationally and everything. Because I know in South Africa, we have uh, Discovery, which is an insurance company. They outsource their call centers to other companies within South Africa. Okay, so in this country, uh, do you think that the companies that are around us, that maybe banks and telecommunication companies, are they really ready to move out of their own internal um, contact centers and actually outsource them? Because I know there's a the element of not trusting uh, yeah, safety of their, their data and their core banking business if it's a bank. So do you think that um, there's a need for awareness or what do you think we should do to, to actually get people to trust that you can move to an outsourcing contact center and you move back? Thank you. I know, I, I, I strongly feel that uh, it is the right time uh, to, to also do that as well. Because if you have to check right now locally, we have companies that really want to set up in-house contact centers. But some, some of them, they are struggling because of the cost uh, element. Maybe they need for them to set up maybe a data center, they need uh, 100,000 US dollars plus eh, for just a 15, 20 seater, including the hardware, the economics, and the software. So for them, obviously, it makes economic sense for them to outsource so that they will focus I mean, on the core business. But we haven't been seeing that, obviously, because maybe of, uh, that uh, awareness. So CCA has it, it has a lot of work to do for, to conscientize companies to say, you know what, instead of you investing maybe 100,000 US dollars plus, you know, right now we are facing I mean, some <coughs> foreign currencies, I mean, you know, challenges as a nation. So instead of waiting, outsourcing is another element. You can outsource, I mean, entirely 100% of the operations. Uh, including the people, or they can outsource, I mean, where they are having their own agents to so have control, then they will, tr they will have that transition as they go on. So I think we recommend that even to small players, but we've been seeing that happening also. I think the, Econet, uh, the Omni Conduct team can also attest to that, that maybe they are making some inroads in mileage in terms of maybe getting corporates that can't set in house contact centers. Then also look at the current companies that have in house contact centers. Uh, we have companies that are struggling to, uh, to have an answer rate of 90% plus. They are struggling. They are, uh, their answer rate maybe, is, uh, maybe for those who are not coming from, this, uh, from the contact centers. If you are talking about answer rate, obviously, we are <coughs> saying if you are receiving 100 calls per day, so then you answer 90 calls. So your percentage answer rate maybe is 90%. So basically, that's what we are saying. So the answer rate for most companies or for some of the companies in Zimbabwe, is below 60%. So we are lobbying now for trust, and for, I think they are here. We are lobbying for trust that we are working with, and the government as well, through the ministry, to say, can you set a threshold? Because it's affecting the customer experience. So if I that in the telecoms companies, for example, maybe if you have a 60% answer rate, so who is answering the 40% of the call? So it means you are depriving the 40% of the customers, maybe you connect after calling maybe for, for 20 minutes. That, that is unacceptable. So we are saying we are lobbying the Arab BZ. Right now it's now a mandate in the financial service sector for every bank to have a contact center in Zimbabwe. Because we've been lobbying for that to happen. And it happened. It's now a mandate. And we also have, I mean, it's, it's in the telecom sector, so we are lobbying the portrayals to say all the telecoms company the answer rate is supposed to be maybe plus 90%. So it means if you can't recruit, for example, if your current date count is seated at 100 agents answering calls, we are saying, and you are answering maybe 60%. Maybe for you, it doesn't make economic sense to recruit additional 100 agents, to have 200 agents, because we have the HR course, the administrative course and stuff. So the option is to outsource, because that, that's not your core business anyway to have a contact center. So that would be the option. Then you will remain with the core activities that will be answered or administered in-house. The non-core activities you can outsource to, to the third party. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, yeah, uh, let me add on something, uh, now that he raised it. Um, in the last 10 years, years in Zimbabwe, we've deployed, I think, a few call centers. Now, the biggest challenge has been the Indian state I'm talking about 2010, 2008. So we had had to either have two service providers and then also use different technologies like uh, SIM card technology where you use uh, voice gateways 
so that in case of your internet, uh, you know, taking a slow, you can switch over. Because like they have said, people out there don't care uh, what the issues you're having here, the network coverage, electricity outages, they don't care. They just want a call being answered uh, in good time. And then uh, to add again to, to what he's saying, as if he was reading my notes actually, <laughs> remotely, uh, is that uh, metrics, there are metrics, standard metrics that are used for all settings, uh, like the average call to ratio, answer scissor ratio, all those metrics. These are standardized in the SLAs, service level agreement. If I remember well, um, Porsche has SLAs for each uh, network provider. But I'm not too sure how far they've gone into enforcing those so that this is the minimum call drop rate. Because I was talking to one uh, potential client here, I won't mention his name or his company. He was saying sometimes his agents get frustrated when they receive calls. I think they've got about 10 internal agents. So for some reason, you know, internet you know, goes up and down. So I was advising that it would be nice to have a whole standby, maybe in terms of SIM cards or fixed line, because we know how internet works, everybody does, as a stock gap measure, especially when they're doing outbound. Because it's pretty, pretty annoying when you cannot hear your customer uh, when they're discussing. So these are the things that are, are not an optional extra in terms of us uh, meeting our needs. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Rob. Um, I wanted to ask uh, the sorties, uh, following the question that I just asked now, what are the challenges or what are the questions or queries that you get from people when you approach them? I'm sure when you, when you launch the uh, only contact, you approach certain companies and you ask them, look, this is what we can do and this is what we can provide for you. What are the, the, their reservations? Why don't they want to partner with you? What, what are those things that they ask you and say, look, I don't want to do this because of ABCD. What are those things that people have reservations about? Thanks, uh, Father. Before we respond to your, to your question, I just also wanted to add in to, to the points, uh, or the big points that are being discussed here. I think one of the key things that I <coughs> highlighted uh, in the presentation that I shared was around your, your digital services and your uh, professional services. It's, 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 it's also um, a, a the fact that you know, service providers need not only rely on agents, human agents, to answer or to take their queries. There is need for you know, deliberate effort in terms of investing into technologies, in your self-care platforms, that enable you to become more efficient with the people that you have. So, for example, the same things that people would be calling for, which would not be don't need a person to answer, but these are more like routine issues, things that a person could potentially do on their own. So, when you look at uh, some of these uh, developed nations, they've uh, invested a lot in terms of uh, your, your self care platforms. Um, I was in, uh, in London at, uh, at uh, the Heathrow Airport. When I, when I went there, I wanted to check in. Normally when I'm checking in here, yeah, obviously I'm looking for one of these uh, ladies to help me check in. And when I went there, there was no one waiting for me. So I'm like, okay. Right, so what I do, and um, of course I did a similar uh, conversation around that with somebody. They said, you know what, you actually do yourself check in. So that's exactly what I did. They only said, you can only speak to a person when the system is failing. So I think part and parcel of the leapfrogging was mentioned earlier on uh, in terms of us coming from where we are to where we want to be is also to study what are the world trends in terms of experience, in terms of uh, optimizing the customer's experience. How do you leverage on things like your AI, artificial intelligence, your robotic process automation, and things like that? That would then you know, give a, 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 a significant bump up to the experience that the customer will actually get. But that's one side in terms of the investment. You also need to look at it from an adoption perspective on the customer side. How ready are our people to actually embrace these technologies and use them to get self-service when it comes to issues that they can do on their own. And um, I, I think we are not very 
we are not known for being very fast in terms of our speed or our agility to actually embrace this technology. So it's a two-way process. There will be investment required for us to educate our market, to teach them, to show them that this is actually possible. We don't necessarily need to kill them. We don't necessarily need to wait. You could do these things on your own from an application, from a web portal, whatever it is in terms of <coughs> the platform that's there. So that's just to try and also give another viewpoint around that. We, instead of us becoming fixated with, okay, fine, and these guys are not answering, what can we do to help them become more efficient? Then to your question, um, I, I started off by saying that um, there's need for a paradigm shift or mindset. Uh, um, I can't remember who it was, uh, who mentioned, um, you know, I think it was uh, my colleague, that um, in India, BPO came around the 90s, into the 2000s, and we are in 2020. You can tell that there's quite a huge gap in terms of where we are. What we are doing today, the likes of India and all these other popular destinations, they were doing it like 20, 30 years ago. Our president is actually recorded as having said that Zimbabwe, we are 20 years behind the rest of the world. Now what does that tell you? It means that some of these concepts, they might be novel in our market, but in other markets, they have since gone on to be developed and defined and optimized to the point that they are way ahead of the curve. Hence, the leapfrogging that is required. So for our part, part of it is to educate people so that they get to understand that this is meant to A, grow your business, grow your job line, grow your bottom line, reduce your costs, make you more cost efficient, and allow people or experts that have invested in the technology, the people, the training, to actually do this at a cost and you hold them accountable to deliver to certain KPIs that you have the upfront. In that way, we find that you focus on your core business, you focus you know, on the meeting that you're good at. And if we become a better player, you've got a, a competitive advantage. I mean, when you look at uh, big corporates, out UK, <coughs> Australia, America, uh, Europe, all these other markets are moving that that part which is not core to their business to to us. <coughs> and these are the you know organizations that we look up to in terms of okay, and what have they done to actually grow their businesses? So it's only wisdom for us to learn it how those that have grown multi billion dollar businesses have actually managed to do that. And by simply the focusing or getting ourselves to look at this in a different manner. When it comes to you know, competitive strategy, most people think that um, uh, if you do what I do, then uh, I become a threat to you. But you need to understand that uh, there are certain competences which I have, which I use to acquire my customers. And once you understand where your strength lies, and then you begin to focus and develop and push on that front, that is what gives you the edge, the headway, and the leadership in the market. So it is it, also about different organizations basically looking at how are they competing and how do they want to be known in the market. Once you define clearly <coughs> what you are about, then regardless of whatever comes, you know that my competitive edge is this and this is what I'm going to drive to take the business forward. Uh, yeah, uh, well, when your question, your question was, um, I realized uh, the, the, the lack of focus has been on international clients. Because I'm seeing so many faces here local, who, who do local stuff, and I feel they are kind of left out because they're like, why am I being here? Now, he raised a point, a very valid one, that the cost of setting up a call center would reach up to 100,000, half a million, even more. But uh, as we all know now, technology has no limits. I mean, doesn't wait for no anybody. So for small organizations, we all know very well, well there's now cloud computing, where, where, where we offer services as a service, right? Where services are there in the cloud. I don't need to own a call center or a server. I rent space maybe 100 grand a month, 10 bucks a month, out of any of the data centers. We have data centers as well here, Tel 1, I think, 
uh, liquid, the ones that I know, the common ones. But they are just as well in, uh, in, in South Africa, which I've used. So what I'm trying to say is for the smaller guys, who, or even for big companies, but who don't want to spend so much in, in outsourcing, getting uh, like 10 agents is no longer as expensive because you can uh, you get that service through Omni or through one of the providers on the cloud, meaning you don't have to invest one on servers in terms of server infrastructure. Number two, you don't have to worry about power outages because these, these guys who own data centers are legally obligated to give you the triple nine, 99 for 999 uptime. They can't go down, it's, it's, it's illegal. So what I'm saying is for the smaller guys, because most of these host services, I think you can confirm that, they come with automated services, like you say, where you call them into a toll-free number, press this for that, press two for that. Some of these things, you don't need an agent at the end of the, of the line to, to, to answer your, your queries, like medical billing, like uh, tracking your, 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 your good, DHL or, you know, you, you understand. So these are the things that the other smaller guys, the barrier of entry, my experience, uh, like in, in 2012, we deployed the call center somewhere in the Arabia for self C. Now, the biggest challenge was, was that it was internet, like we said, but we hosted it on the cloud. So the only thing that they did, that company, was to get, because VoIP was legalized in Zimbabwe, I think 2007, uh, so it means we could get South African numbers from here, meaning they, these agents could actually tell the markets to South Africa using a South African number. Because it would be weird for you in Devon or in, in Cape Town, like, oh, this is Bobby number and you're selling a local product. So I'm trying to encourage the small organizations that they can uh, approach any of these guys, Aveo, Omni, Equinet, who provide the services and get hosted services at the fraction of a cost and without having to worry about uh, buying very expensive equipment. In fact, uh, it has even gone far. Like he said, uh, virtual assistant, on this phone, you can run a call center. Oh, you didn't know from, from, from this. People work from home from this as long as they have internet connection. I think you explain more on that. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. That's very really exciting actually because I'm sure a lot of us in here are thinking, okay, yeah, we get that there's an international market and all that, but what about us? So you pretty much put it in a nutshell that, look, you can also outsource your business or your contact center to any of the outsourcing contact centers that are available in Zimbabwe. And you would actually just reduce your cost in terms of infrastructure, in terms of even the agents themselves. And then you would focus more on your core business. And that would make um, a lot of difference. So, um, Mr. Ryan, I think as the last question, I just wanted to know, like, um, what are your expectations from the government? What do you think? What do you need the government to do in order for us to go towards the right step, or in order for us to move towards the right end? Yeah, it's so unfortunate that the minister is not yet in here. <laughs> I would have really loved Jamie to answer that when the minister is here. Yes. But oh, of course, I mean, they are aware because we've been submitting, mm -hmm. you know, our proposition, I mean, as an industry board and also representing the players who are here in Zimbabwe. So there are some, of course, there are many things that we'd want the government to do, but sometimes we know how it works in government. Sometimes they need to go through parliament and the other bureaucracies that, I mean, you know, come into play, but I mean, there are some few things, there, there are other things that they can do without really investing a lot. So for government, we need support in terms of, we have some, uh, our embassies in different countries. So those embassies, we want also to, them, or we've already requested them, so that they can play a role in terms of also marketing the Zimbabwean destination. But obviously, maybe I've started maybe at the end, so we locally right now what we need is for government to play a major role for them to be at the forefront, not the association, not the, not the private players. Then obviously if you are going international, the association will be at the forefront because usually people, they don't trust governments. So as an association, we are representing players and will be more trusted. So we want them as locally to play a bigger role in terms of promoting the destination in Zimbabwe. We want them to also come up with incentives 
Because right now we don't have a package, I mean, an incentive plan that is that we have right now with the investors to come in or our colleagues there to say what are the incentives, I mean, that are there in Zimbabwe. It's just speculation that we have submitted already. But we don't have something that is off the shelf that we can say, you know what, off the head, we, if we are to set up a contact center in Zimbabwe, the, there will be some tax rebate. Uh, contact centers maybe they are in the special economic zones. So these are the things that we expect from the government. And if you are to, for every three people that you recruit, maybe there's this plus, I mean, incentive that you get from the government. But that's the norm elsewhere. But the whole idea is to create jobs. And you know, right now it's a nightmare for the government. They are struggling to create jobs here in Zimbabwe. And this is the low hanging fruit. And I know we can create over 30,000 jobs if they just commit to it. In the next three years, we can do that. It's so easy. But for that to happen now, we need to incentivize so that player, players like Omniconduct, and other players also who are here in Zimbabwe handling international clients, they need to have those incentives. It will lower down their costs and it will also help, I mean, you know, for them to compete in a very competitive way uh, globally and even regionally. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, uh, would you have any expectations as well from a personal point of view and from someone who's also been <coughs> saying what help do you think we need for us to improve ourselves better? In terms of government. Yes, from the government. Yeah, and like, I think it's pretty said everything. Uh, I'll come on the technical side. Like I said, uh, giving services online in real time is time sensitive. You cannot afford to have delays, right? Especially in voice. You cannot afford to have packet loss. You cannot afford to have jitter. But in other services, maybe like, um, Email, you can resend an email to take time to get there. So on that, I think um, the, some time, three years ago, I think the bill has been passed now, right? the infrastructure sharing, it was really critical because the, the telcos were saying uh, it's expensive to, to run networks, like of light, because of you know, the challenges that we've been facing, you know, this is why. But now that the government has come in and said, no, you must share the fiber components, you must share towers. That way, uh, all of the players benefit because they, they cut their, their, their costs, which can be extended to the end user. So I think on that part, uh, they have done the con, uh, a long stretch. But they can do more in terms of several health LA. And I'll repeat this a little many times because, uh, like he has said, out there they don't care if you're from Malawi or from, from Tanzania or Zimbabwe. It's just the same thing. So we cannot have data that is not protected. So things like data protection bill that I think is being tabled. These are the things that we need to, that they are moved. So that those guys know that there's legislation in place to protect their data. I'll take you know, sensitive stuff here, or on the government side. I think oh, that's, that's much on the legal side. And then uh, the other stuff, that the last part, is the skills development, digital skills development. We have so many students that are churned out of college, and it's one to realize that we are not taking advantage of those students. Except for HITT, there's a, there's a rather institute of something. I remember I gave a, a, some, some some paper about blockchain to them, and those guys came and started doing a, you know, blockchain, a 3 and stuff. And what I'm trying to say is government must, through those colleges, partner up with uh, Viatel, One, Ameo, all these companies that are displayed here, to, to kind of incubate that house. These are what they do abroad. And, and, and that way it reduces the cost, because at that time those guys are students. Software development, really needs an uplift because like we all know or like most of you know it's very expensive to write software but we have open source if you're a linux user you will understand what i'm trying to say but we need to kind of encourage those kind of things government needs to there's got chinoy university there's pindura there's nast msu i think of, of all of them are visited msu and nast they've gone a long way in terms of trying to have local hubs, local talent. Uh, back where I come from in Blauayo, 
uh, there's a primary school which I attended apparently, where we do what you call e court, court for kids, where they, they learn how to, to make games when they are young. But we are trying to build that kind of culture and teacher skills like the other lady presented here. So what I'm trying to say is this thing that these two gentlemen uh, are referring to is basically we have to start with what we have. There, there will never be a day when the situation will be ideal. That will never happen. So we have to deal, we start with what we have. And uh, we have a lot, lot of things. Like I said, I started doing work in 2001. That time it was illegal, actually. We were almost thrown in jail. Uh, we, we made our first call from Edgar's, Bulawayo, to Edgar's Harada, over a telephone internet line. But it was not allowed. This is why I had to go to the state. Because it was not, but a few years later, Void was legal. So now we are catching up, and these guys, I'm very impressed because I wrote that paper that you, you, you read 10 years ago, and I was like, am I talking to myself? I'm on the moon, and I'm really happy for, for, for this. So, yes, the government can help us with that. And the uh, tax rebates or tax relief is very critical. You know, yes, it is. But these guys, CCAs, yes, they've done a lot of work. I've been following and watching them. That uh, they are doing a lot of work. And uh, besides that, uh, with the electricity thing, the government has already uh, removed the duty of solar panels, right? Is that so? Solar equipment. So, I'm saying it must be mandatory now. If we are building a call center, to build it with solar, like these guys. That way we won't have challenges, international or local, for that matter, uh, in terms of that. So that, that's, this will be my short immediate expectation, because I, I think to expect too much, there are things that we can do without government, without breaking the law as well. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, do you have any expectations as well? <coughs> Yeah, just a few parting thoughts. Uh, most of them have been touched on, but I'd like to just say that um, the government, I guess, needs to take advantage of the momentum that has already been created. Um, you know, somebody once said that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. If you look at it, you know, from a macro perspective, there was no other time in the history of this country than now that this idea should actually be pursued with a lot of attention. What am I saying? We, we, we are grappling with unemployment, we are grappling with issues of foreign currency, but we've got all sorts of issues, but as I said earlier on, the opportunities lie in the problems that we're faced with. So it's an opportunity for you know, us as a country to start doing something about our future going forward. <coughs> I mean, what is required, in my view, from government <coughs> is for them now to, to take that leading role in terms of actually driving this forward. We don't have to look very far. When you look at South Africa, we've got an excellent case study from the Western Cape that they've done extremely well. Government has been playing a very pivotal role in terms of the development of that uh, sector, uh, the PPO sector within South Africa. And it's, became, it's become one of those uh, global case studies on the continent even today. So it's, it's only one and a half hours, you know, to, 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 to get a job again, and another two hours you're in uh, Cape Town. We can learn from, from, from what they have done. We don't have to pay the same school fees that they paid. They did this over a period of time. We are at an advantage that we can actually do it in a shorter space of time by understanding where their pain points were, where their head was, their, their experience, and what we can do differently in the, in the, in the country. And as we, as, we, as we do that, we find that um, we will actually be up there with the rest of the world because we have also leveraged on what other people experience and basically turned it to our advantage as a, as a country. So we, we need uh, them to come on board. I'm, I'm happy that the minister is coming through. At least it shows what uh, the there's that commitment and buying, and they see that there's actually value in initiatives such as this one. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Okay, close it. Cutting mic. Okay. Okay. I was, was going to ask the questions first, and then again. Oh, okay, that's yeah. right. Okay, so just before we conclude, does anyone have any questions or any comments to make?
Thank you very much. My name is Lewis Mishan, and I'm here at Consultant with the Capital Code of the Art of Education Commission. And I'm also here to be over the table with my name. I think from the discussion that is taking place, as I'm not knowing what is coming, um, it, 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 there seems to be a gap um, in terms of source code. We've been concentrating a lot on technology, technology, technology. And the clients that we work with, 80% of the problem that they have for customers relates to responses to their outlets. And these come by <coughs> customer care centers. And uh, the complaint has always been the personnel um, manning these uh, concepts are not um, sensitive enough uh, when it comes to them relaying their problems. So if you look at websites or you know uh, social media sites like uh, there's, there's one on, um, on Facebook called Name Chain, quite a number of the complaints come through companies that have failed to address basic issues via call centers because of the manner in which the, the personnel conduct themselves or report. And uh, there is a, 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 an area there that we need to work on in terms of training of the personnel. Yes, we might move towards artificial intelligence, but at the end of the day, the human interaction is all the day. And I think that is what um, CCA said works on when, when it offers, you know, uh, or the challenges to the government trade. That is a very critical area if we are going to be an international, um, you know, outsourcing uh, uh, market where people have to be confident that the, the you know, whatever queries that they route to the call centers will be addressed in a manner in which will be satisfied. So I think that is very critical. A investment in training of personal soft skills, emotional intelligence, whatever it, it may be, in order for us all to, 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 to add value to the IT aspect of the, 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 the information that you've been giving us today. Secondly, I like the element of, of you know, government coming to the party, not as just as a regulator, but also as a facilitator in ensuring that the, 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 this kind of, uh, you know, uh, business operates properly. But also in assisting organizations in terms of um, the element of R and D. We have got, in the way we have so many universities, like Robert is saying, and these are right areas for us to be able to set up these these information centers from where our local business and then tax So these are the elements that I want to share. Thank you very much, sir. Do we have any other comments and questions? Good morning, my name is Dr. Sir. Uh, my question is that you mentioned earlier that the infrastructure share bill has since been passed. What has been the impact of that bill to the costs, for instance, to call centers, particularly when you're looking at the smaller ones that are going to start up? Has there been any impact? Should we be expecting an impact? Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Uh, what I spoke about is that uh, last time I checked two years ago, our government uh, set up a bill that uh, infrastructure be shared. So the idea is, is that when you share infrastructure, it means your upstream end of cost. Because uh, if I remember well, we get our internet through what? Easy home. Uh, I'm saying the lending ports. Uh, 
uh, easy come in Cape Town, Deben, Swakum Pond, uh, maybe somewhere in Angola. So, so the idea is to, to, to have those cost savings trickle down from the backbone carrier, like liquid tel one, to the smaller carriers and eventually to be passed on to the end user. So your question is, uh, are the call centers realizing that? Now, the tricky part of that question is because of the distortion of prices. If you ask me uh, from outside the country in terms of the U.S. price, I would say the data is pretty fair and people don't like me inside here. So uh, what I'm trying to say is the, the, the challenges that are there make it very dis difficult for, for people to realize those cost savings. This is why I even uh, mentioned the, the use of hosted centers. Because once you use a virtual center in the cloud, your cost it doesn't matter. It's, it's low inherently. So these one-to-one -one connections, uh, these guys are struggling with these telcos because for them, they pay in hard currency upstream to the guys who have undersea cables to Europe, to Asia, to India, to China, to the US. They pay in hard currency, but they collect in in local. So I, I think I'm not a finance person, but I don't have to explain what this means. Eh? You understand? They're collecting local, they pay in, in hard currency. So that in itself puts them in a, in a very soft position. But ideally, the idea of sharing towers and infrastructures that uh, the per data, uh, sorry, the per megabit cost is reduced. Now, what I don't know, which might be my next research paper, is is this being really passed? If so, how much? If not, where is it going? Or is it being eaten up by inflation? In fact, that's a, a very good question. And that's one great. No, I'll just give a, a brief comment. I think um, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure here is not anything new. It's a concept that's, um, you know, old and uh, has been used and adopted uh, worldwide. I remember uh, in South Africa at some point, uh, with the coming in of MVNOs, they were basically riding on existing infrastructure that was already deployed by other players. I think what 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 what, what probably could have contributed to some of the debate was the approach with the manner in which it was being proposed, uh, which basically was ignoring the investment that certain players in the industry would have invested into that infrastructure. And then I woke up from nowhere and all of a sudden I'm writing on top of infrastructure for you know for almost a song. Um, you know, with all due respect, <laughs> we are in business. And uh, the shareholder, when they invest in infrastructure, they are expecting the return on that investment. That's the reason why we all you know, go to work to ensure that we generate an ROI for our shareholders. Having said that, I think it's the methodology, the approach to it. Once it makes sense, business sense, that is, once it's fair, once it's equitable, I don't think there should be even a debate or a discussion around this. And to your point about uh, should we be celebrating, I'll probably say, you know what, there are opportunities around you actually giving your business, as what was being said earlier, to somebody to run it on your behalf. You know exactly what you want to achieve. And these are the terms of reference that you can agree up front with your provider. This is what I'm looking at. This is how I'm going to measure whether this is being successful or not. And from there, you basically you know, taken away from yourself the headache of having to look for the forex to service those platforms, to upgrade those platforms, to invest in, in those particular platforms. And you, you know, and your customers become the judge of that service that is being delivered on your behalf whether it is meeting your expectation or it is actually falling short. And then you can now look at what sort of remedial actions you can implement to address that. But I think for now, what I can say is available, because the infrastructure sharing part of it was really talking to the, the network infrastructure at a macro, at a macro level. On site, uh, situations like this, you can consider outsourcing as one of the options or going into the cloud, which is also another form of outsourcing.
Um, great. Um, thank you very much. I would really like us to take more questions, but uh, because of time, we have to just close it here. Um, if you have more questions, uh, the gentlemen are still here until the end of the session. You can find them and just have a quick chat with them and get all the answers that you need. Um, I think we'll just ask our writers to say some closing remarks and then we go. Okay, so I just want to maybe to focus and look into the in-house contact centers. Obviously, we have other people who are coming from different companies for you to also benefit from this. Because I've noticed that uh, many times uh, people are motivated for headcount increases within our companies. You want to increase the headcount for you to meet maybe the number of calls or for you to improve the service level agreement, to improve the percentage answer rate and other KPIs. But sometimes it's, it's shut down. Because here in Zimbabwe, we've noticed that for our in-house contact centers, maybe they are regarded as cost centers <coughs> because you are not adding value to the company. But there are various mechanisms that you can use for, it, for you to shift your contact center to be a profit center so that at least the Mr. Finance guy will really appreciate to say, you know what, I think this makes sense. So we are going to give you a headcount because you are going to generate revenue, maybe more than the, 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 the sales team if you are coming from insurance and stuff. So these are the things that you need to focus on as well. Then for in-house contact centers also, for, in terms of a culture, we, there's someone who was talking about training. Training, yes, is very, very good, and it's good business for, also for us as an association. <laughs> That's how we survive. Even for CISM, I think they, are, they will be happy with that. But also without the culture transformation, because we've seen many times we just send people for training and stuff, and these are only junior staff members. But when they go back, I mean, to their workplaces, they try to implement it as a cute sometimes. They face resistance because the culture, there's no culture change. So it needs to be something that is trickling down from the CEO up to the, someone at the bottom of the, of the pyramid. They need to appreciate, I mean, you know, a customer experience. As a, it has to be a culture starting from the CEO. Where a CEO has to visit, maybe the contact center, maybe once a month. But sometimes we've seen CEOs or directors or executives, and some of them maybe were here, they've never visited a contact center. They, they just see that over the email, or they just know that we have a contact center in, internally. So these are the things that we need to work on if you want to improve customer experience, and we need our contact centers to be empowered. But right now they are not empowered sometimes. They are taken as a second cousin within the companies. So how do you expect culture, I mean, to have a culture of service excellence if you don't even appreciate if you don't need to have, you don't even have maybe some mechanism for these guys to be motivated within the contact center. So maybe as maybe as delegates also, these are the things that we now need to recommend, I mean to, to recommend and put in place to see how best can we make sure that people in the contact center are so relevant. Not that they are better than other employees, but they are the, these are the people or the constituents who are handling the bulk of your business. And if they mess up with your customers, the company will, will close. Absolutely. So these are the things that I thought maybe for those other delegates who are coming from within our contact centers. But of course, I mean, obviously for, for the government, we've spoken about that. What, what our, our expectations are so clear and we'll continue to push for, for, for those expectations. And for those who want to invest and maybe uh, be part of the in-house, uh, I mean, uh, of the business process of sourcing, I think, I mean, we are not, you won't be, co it's not competition or we are not competing. We want as many players as we can in the industry. If you have many players, there's Omni Conduct, there are other players who are in Jonas City, we have others who are in Newlands, and uh, we also have other players. We now have about five players who are handling international customers. Others are doing back office. So, if you are to have many players in the industry, the advantage of doing that is that we have our number of seats as a country will increase. And let's unite and come together. So that at least it's not only Omni Conduct that is going to Europe or for this international conference to pitch the Zimbabwean destination. Because when they are going there, they're not going to pitch Omni Conduct. But sometimes they'll say, who are you? You get the point? Yes, they, are, they have a cloud, they have some money and stuff, but Mike, I think, have been in the field, they can, can, they can care. That is not about your money or how big you are in your country. You need to go as a force where the industry association is also at the forefront, and the government is backing that up. We pull out our resources together, and it's easy now. We send delegates, maybe representation from different companies. If you do that now, the dividends will be so evident within our company. But for now, it's so difficult because if you have one player that is at the forefront, is investing everything, then other players that will come maybe after one year and stuff, they are sort of, I mean, you know, basking on other people's glory, which is so wrong. So let's come up together. Let's really attack the global market together as one industry. I think it will help us in a big way. I think I'll end here.
also an illustration of uh, customer experience they use in digital platforms. That is from one of our sponsors, Amir. Thank you very much. Um, this event has been made successful by Amir, Tech24, Cassava Smart Tech, Omni Contact, Internet Wireless, Chartered Institute of Customer Management, Tel One, Net One, Stuart Bank, and CARS, who are our hosts. At this point in time, I'd like to call up on the next panel. When the next panel is coming, just stand up for a comfort break. We are not going outside. Just stand up and, and sit down um, as I call up on our next panel. Um, I would like to call up from Hazel Chitare from All Mutual Contact Center. She's the All Mutual Center Manager, Hazel Chitare. And um, on this panel, we have Ms. Hololang Tororo. Raul again, uh, and Judith Asalan. I'm through, give them their hand as they come. Apparently today we have three conversations happening across the country 
on employment promotion. One is that the EZ where we are talking about the future of working tourism and jobs. And there's another event happening in Blue where we are talking about the future of work in terms of the green economy and green opportunities as we seek to address the unemployment challenge. So thank you very much for inviting us here. It's an unusual you know, platform for us as the ILO, but I think we are glad to join you for the conversation. Thank you very much and um, welcome once again. Our topic, impact sourcing, the people in contact centers for employment and economic development in Zimbabwe. So to start off with, I'd just like us to perhaps uh, just take us through what impact sourcing is, um, where is this happening, what have been the advantages in the countries where it's happening. Interesting. So, uh so what I start with is again uh, there has been a couple of times it has been mentioned but uh, I'll start with the journey that India took back in 1990s where we were at that point of time and uh, where we are now and what can Zimbabwe learn in terms of the impact sourcing. Now in terms of the impact sourcing uh, when we are talking about it, it has a direct correlation with the employment generation specifically in the youth uh, with uh, uh, with a very minimal of the skill sets uh, and the training needs, they can get employment really quickly. However, there are other factors which are needed to uh, get it right, uh, get the right environment, right, right ecosystem in place. Uh, and uh, in the previous panelists already spoke about few of such, which were um, uh, cost of infrastructure, uh, skill development programs, having a body in place, which is CCDS right now. Uh, a lot of lobbying with the government required uh, to make sure that uh, there are enough employment generation opportunities which come with the impact sourcing. Now to answer your question, uh, I'll probably take it back uh, in uh, 1990s where India at that point of time decided to pick uh, outsourcing as one of the destinations. And uh, I remember the figure, 343 billion was what was supposed the total market size of uh, uh, of the entire uh, world and I believe at this point of time the last numbers I read I think it was uh, it was eight to nine months back where the uh, size of uh, uh, Indian uh, outsourcing industry had grown to about 38 billion which is somewhere greater than 10 percent of the total size. Now if I look at it compare it to the few other countries uh, where are we with respect to Zimbabwe's uh, ecosystem of uh, um, uh, or the value of the BPO industry vis-a-vis -vis where it can reach. The figures that I have uh, at this point, I couldn't find, I was trying to locate on the uh, laptop and try to see if there is a study, but apparently uh, there is no study which means that it is less than 15 million. Now, uh, if it is less than 15 million, you can easily leapfrog the 500 million to 600 million very, very quickly. The countries have done it. Countries have done it in very, very quick time, in a couple of years' time, which means the employment generation, uh, uh, the figure that I was quoted that every $100,000 of investment which comes in, uh, you have one employment generated. I think one, every $50,000 of uh, 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 investment which comes in, you have at least one employment generated. Now talk about 100 million and 200 million and kind of employment uh, opportunities that Zimbabwe can generate in one year. So uh, talking about impact sourcing, I think there are a lot of opportunities here in Zimbabwe where we can start off and a lot of low hanging fruits, a lot of quick successes that we can do. Thank you. And um, over to you, Philippa. Being a social entrepreneur, you what is your experience with impact sourcing? How are we doing in this area? I just want to kind of answer that question with giving you a little background. Why am, why am I even sitting here today? I actually come from a call center background. So when I was in college, going in, um, studying healthcare, I was a call center manager at the age of 24, and I was overseeing 400 employees um, as an area manager. So I've sat in a call center, I, 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 you know, it was a telecoms call center for what we now call AT&T, and that was back in 2002. So 
But impact sourcing uh, is something that has to be felt and seen. It's not something where we have to go and Google and you know, try to find it. It is felt and seen because when there's social impact happening, it's, it's, it's evident. So the town that this call center was in, it had a thousand employees. Uh, it was in a town called Midland, Texas, primarily an oil town. So oil and gas, petroleum engineers, those type, of, those type of people. But the call center then provided for another group of employees that then supported the entire ecosystem. So we're not just talking about it. These employees are eating at the restaurants, they're banking at the local uh, you know, banks, they are buying houses, they're buying cars, and it creates a thriving ecosystem. What am I seeing in the market currently? Not much. I'm not seeing and feeling that social impact. So even if we were to sit down and start recording numbers um, and scrapping for those numbers, we're scrapping for them. We want to be able to talk about social impact where we can see it and feel it. And that's why um, my role, for instance, as a, as a board member at the public hospital, which is a 1,200 bed hospital, is we go around the world and we're seeing a shift in healthcare. Um, currently today in San Francisco, the average nurse makes $90 an hour and it's becoming unsustainable. So the healthcare costs of, of running ICUs, you know, about five years ago I was involved in a telemedicine project which put robotics um, in an ICU setting where you have a doctor you know, doing patient rounds late in the afternoon through an ICU unit using te uh, telemedicine. Why did we get to that point? Uh, you know, we got to that point because it's becoming increasingly expensive to be able to, to manage uh, physicians in the hospital setting, but you know, outsourcing was the best way to go. So I think the social impact is something that is not just about numbers, but it's really about seeing and feeling it within the community itself. Thank you, Philippa. So, over to you, Adolphus. Philippa says it has to be seen, it has to be felt, and um, nothing much of it has been seen and felt in Zimbabwe. What role then can the government play in promoting the purely and also seen to promote job creation in Zimbabwe? Well, um, maybe we can look at uh, this scenario from the other side and say, so what are we feeling and what are we seeing? And um, I would say that, ask yourself this question, I think students of history, when the ILO was formed in 1919, ask yourself what had happened and what was happening in the world of work. And ask yourself today again, in 2019, as the ILO celebrates 100 years, I'm not 100 years myself, but the ILO is celebrating 100 years. I might look like I'm 100 years old, <laughs> with the white hairs and all, but Ask yourself what is, up, what is happening, what are we seeing? And I think uh, Raul did mention one of the dimensions, which is the youth bulge. In Zimbabwe right now, almost 70% of the population is below 35 years. We are seeing, of course, yes, technology, I think, you know, it's there for everyone to see. But there's globalization. There's climate change. And I think those that, you know, experience the weather pattern this year, we have a drought, we have cyclone die. So there are things that are intervening in the world of work that are forcing us to change the way we approach some of you know, these issues, including employment creation, including running our businesses. So what we are seeing are the challenges that we have. And I think what we are requesting and we are providing as guidance as ILA is a normative organization is to say we should be looking for opportunities to create more and more jobs. Because as we know, I think uh, Rhinos was here, he mentioned uh, graduates coming out of the educational system. I think at the last count, minimum 300,000 every year into a job market in Zimbabwe, which is shrinking. And government has to look at this sector in terms of the potential it has for investment, the potential it has for job creation, and the potential it has for really taking this country into you know, a developed country. And uh, I'd say that um, it's a pity that they are not here. Uh, and I speak as a UN agency. And uh, we 
work with government in most of the cases. And I think these are kind of the kind of discussions we need to start having about job creation. And I think listening to the earlier panels and I was look, looking at the presentation by, I think, by Otis, uh, and I was challenging uh, my uh, panel moderator to say that I want to see a presentation that actually, instead of putting dollars in terms of putting maybe the reach in terms of your customer base and all that, why don't you put jobs? Why don't you put the impact that you're having on communities? Maybe government, as the politicians, you know, will be attracted to some of these conversations. But I think the potential is there, whether it's 343 billion or 243 billion. I can just give you some statistics. I know in the uh, Philippines, the indicative figure in 2016 was that this sector globally, including the call centers, 7.3% of GDP, uh, employing over a million people. In India, I think it's 9.3% of GDP, employing over 3.7 million people. So I think when you look at the figures, Philippines, India, and the population of Zimbabwe, if we are able to get you know, pro rata, that kind of a percentage, in terms of business, in terms of employment creation, you can imagine what impact it will have on, 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 on the general populace. And I think this is what the government needs to do. Policies, programs, incentives for business to be able to create these opportunities for young people. For example, the technology is there, but if the policies are not right, I think Robert was talking about you know, that in, back in 2007, he was almost arrested for having done some little bit of stuff over a telephone line. So it meant that at that time, there was no law that was facilitating that kind of, you know, kind of business. So that's the role that government has to play and, and, and kind of facilitate so that we can take this kind of forward. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Kaleva. We continue to hear about graduates leaving the universities, they are unemployed, but besides the graduates, there are other societies that are also unemployed that are disadvantaged worse than the graduates themselves because they don't have access to employment. Perhaps they are in a remote area somewhere in Gobe, they are in a remote area in Togo. What initiatives can um, impact sourcing uh, take into account to make sure that there is employment creation even in those remote areas, even without it to be somebody can survive job? What can be done? I think impact sourcing and the whole call center space gives us a different dimension of opportunity. As many have um, talked about this on different panels, that nowadays you can work from home and you can work from a phone. And we know with our literacy rate and um, with our ability to, to, to adapt, Zimbabweans in general as a culture, I have a, a great ability to adapt. Even in those rural areas, which the cost is even lower, for, which gives a great opportunity for an investor, that's something we need to think about. And I, 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 I go back to healthcare, of course that is my area of strength. We have a, um, a helipad at our central hospital, and we, we're looking at ways in which to grow that space. Um, Zipline in Rwanda delivers black products around the country, and I think it's just a matter of coming up with you know, viable partnerships with the government, because obviously these are um, hospitals owned by the government, but it's about coming up with viable partnerships that are win-win for both the government and the private entity to be able to maybe utilize some of the infrastructure that's already there to rethink a pharmacy in a rural community that empowers people in that rural community. Maybe rethink um, you know, skills in a rural community where, where maybe you can have video feed. Um, we can train people online to learn how to intubate a patient or how to resuscitate a patient. And there's so many skills that can be transferred through video feed in today's world. So the rural communities, our population in Zimbabwe is primarily the rural communities. I mean, the bulk of the population is there. So we certainly have to be thinking along those lines in terms of investment. So yeah, those are all, I mean, healthcare initiatives, but that can be transferred in other spaces like agriculture, you know, in terms of training, in terms of skills being transferred. Thank you very much. And Rowan, um, talking of skills, and um, I just, Thinking back, 
they have certain organizations, charities that support impact um, sourcing for, for a cause. And they actually support companies that take up impact sourcing. Can you tell us a bit about this? What do they do? How can people benefit if they want to go into impact sourcing? How can they benefit from this? The structures that are already available. Yeah. Uh, so most of the organizations uh, have the CSR budget in place, at least sometimes 0.1, sometimes 0.5 percent, where they uh, have specific agendas in mind, and a lot of them have uh, job creation as an uh, as an agenda in uh, in mind. And uh, talking about job creation, I think uh, uh, what people are missing over here, the point uh, that people are missing over here is. Every one job created in a BPO in an organized sector creates another job in an unorganized way. Which essentially means that if you are employing one agent, there would be somebody who would be selling food for him, transportation for him, education for him, infrastructure for him, housing for him. There are jobs which are created in parallel economies. Which essentially means, and I can take example of India by the way, in, uh, our, uh, there were jobs which were created in transportation industry when uh, BPO started to go. There were these uh, caps which came, small caps, which uh, small cap industries which started to boom. And there were these cap drivers uh, who got jobs and they were from uh, a town which were 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers away. They took their caps, they took the loans and started driving those caps. Which means that there were jobs created. Similarly, housing, similarly, infrastructure, similarly, uh, education, skills. Uh, if we want government uh, bodies to come up and say, how do we create jobs, this is probably one of the things that can drive BPO industry. I just want to answer your question. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight uh, was I definitely wanted to take one example. Uh, of a government uh, uh, initiated project uh, of again employment job creation as well as skill development. I remember having a, uh, having to attend a conference back in uh, Bangladesh, and the Bangladesh Ministry had set up this uh, skill development uh, organization, uh, sorry, skill development college or institute. Uh, uh, in a town which was about 100 kilometers from Dhaka, uh, which, is, which is their capital city, and it had a capacity of 10,000 people getting educated. Which means, and they estimated that apart from uh, having uh, 10,000 people getting skilled over there, they would generate about 20,000 employment in the parallel economies, which essentially meant in transportation, in, 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 in infrastructure, in housing, and so on and so forth. Uh, and may I disrupt the comment? Sure. May we all rise? Um, we, we welcome our minister, who is uh, the Minister of Information, Communication, Technology, Postal and Career Services, Honorable Kazebe Kazebe, and his delegation, uh, the Permanent Secretary, Engineer Kondishora. So we we'll continue with the final discussion and um, then later on we will introduce our uh, platform uh, Mr. Manuva to introduce our guest of the So just give us a recap of what you're talking about so that we can get it. Thank you and uh, very well welcome to our Honourable Minister. This panel, which is our third panel for the day, is discussing on the topic impact sourcing BPO in contact centres for employment and economic development in Zimbabwe. With me here on the panels is Raoul Zoshi, Philippe Svanda and Adolfo Shinome. So, um, it's a very good thing that you came in whilst we are still here because Adolfo was very passionate about one of the key issues that we raised that he would be prepared to talk about 
that you have been praying to talk about while you are here. So perhaps Rahul will just briefly finish the point he was talking about sure. and we'll quickly move on again to Adolfus on the same issue that we would have preferred for you to hear. Thank you. So uh, first of all, welcome to our honorable minister. And the thing that we were talking about, uh, and it's a very, very good time to be in, was employment generation uh, for the people of Zimbabwe and how uh, the BPO industry can contribute it. The point that I was trying to make at that point of time was uh, for every one employment uh, which is being created in the uh, BPO industry, there is one another employment created in the parallel economy which is either in um, infrastructure, in transportation, in education. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight, highlight was one of the projects taken up in, um, in Bangladesh. And uh, what they did was they set up an institute of uh, uh, skill development uh, from about 100 miles from uh, uh, from the capital city of Dhaka, uh, which was of the capacity of 10,000 uh, uh, people. And they estimated that they would generate 20,000 employment in the parallel economy with that institute in terms of teachers, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of housing. And at the same time, they would get 10,000 people every six months ready uh, to be uh, coming in for the BPO industry. So that was a really, really good initiative. Why I wanted to highlight that initiative was uh, from your question. There were organizations, I remember, I don't know the name, but there were organizations apart from the Ministry of ICT in Bangladesh who contributed to this cause and really work into, uh, uh, work into take up job creation in Bangladesh as a part of their CSR. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, we'll come back to you, Adolphus. I'll give you that question once again. Perhaps you can summarize it once more now that we have the presence of the Honorable Minister. The question was what role can the government play in promoting BPO and impact outsourcing to promote job creation? So, from that question, we can quickly also then move over to the next question, which follows that one, which says what are the recommendations for improving business, uh, for improving job creation? for businesses and for um, Thank you, Madam Moderator. Good afternoon, Madam Minister. I think uh, I would love to just pick it up from what Raul, I think, has said. Is that I think when we are looking at economic development and we are looking at uh, managing an economy like Zimbabwe, I think uh, the key challenge that we see is the creation of employment and employment for who? For young people mainly, and I've indicated the figure of 70 percent being 35 and below. And maybe I wouldn't need to ask or to tell you what failure to create jobs would look like. And I think you are seeing what is happening in the sub region. You have seen what has happened elsewhere. I think there's those talks of the Arab Spring and so forth and so forth. But what is the potential? I think this sector holds. And I think we have uh, colleagues who can share experiences from other countries, including India, I think, where this sector is now contributing 10% of GDP and contributing to you know, 3.7 million jobs in, in India, 1 million jobs in the Philippines, and I think we have other countries like uh, you know, Brazil, we have uh, other countries like uh, Mexico, who are also doing very well in terms of you know, uh, PPOs. What government could do is to take the deliberate step to make sure that they support job creation. Zimbabwe right now is on a drive to attract investment. What sort of investment are we looking for? Is it investment that will destroy jobs? The ILO has come together now at, it, at its 100th year birthday to say what is the next 100 years going to look like? And we've come up with a declaration on what we call the future of work. And my director general says, the future is not determined, but we can shape it today. And I think as it remains today, and maybe as Zimbabwe is following on, the sector or the industry still remains labor intensive. And it's a huge opportunity, particularly for countries that have won, huge endowments in terms of skills and literacy. And I think if, when you start talking about those things or those attributes, Zimbabwe comes out top. So if we are not investing in the youth, if we are not investing in engaging them in productive employment, we could be missing a key developmental asset 
and we could miss what reaping what they call the demographic, uh, demographic dividend. So in terms of yes, it's an opportunity, but there are also challenges. And I think we are discussing here impact sourcing and business process outsourcing. Impact sourcing at the lower end, I think, is looking at annual incomes of about three thousand dollars using the local, uh, you know, purchasing, purchasing power parity. Is that the kind of job that you want to create here in Zimbabwe? Can someone survive on three thousand US dollars per year in Zimbabwe? Maybe these are the things that we need to analyze, and this, this is what my colleague panelists was saying that we really need to find out more information and how we can fuel this more strongly. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities that are in this kind of employment, kind of promotion uh, initiatives, particularly in this sector, because there is a strong interrelation between, you know, humans and also technology. If you were to adopt AI in most of your contact centers, you could probably lose jobs. But I think we could make a choice to say, maybe we could delay, uh, you know, adopting technologies, but, you know, use people and gradually, you know, turn the economy towards, uh, you know, advancing in technologies. What would this have overall? I think a lot of the colleagues who are here are marketers. And I think this is the core phase of, you know, the business idea that, I mean, it to make money. How can we be convinced that we need to make sure that all our adoption of technologies is up to creating jobs? You talk of the customer experience. The customer experience assumes an ability to spend. So how do people spend? They have to earn an income. So I think we are looking for a balanced approach between the objectives of business, the objectives of government, to make sure that we're able to create what we call decent jobs. These are the jobs that would allow business and people and firms and enterprises to exist as an ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe my last question to you, Felipa. Um, how can further investment in the impact sourcing uh, industry in Zimbabwe help with our employment um, creation, not just in the contact center industry, but overall? How can better investment in this area as well? I think, welcome, Honorable. Um, I think we have a, a huge opportunity to um, grow the space. However, I think we have to also come from a value-based, um, a value-based uh, set of rules and ethics. So, just recently, CNBC was reporting that. 200 CEOs came together and for the first time in decades they unanimously agreed that you know they were going to think outside of the shareholder value as their purpose for an organization. So the social impact piece, um, as we are looking at further investment, we want to make sure that at the end of the day, like he said, it's not about just temporarily taking on jobs that will be lasting another you know, three to five years. Like I said, if you looked at those, those um, communities around the world that did lose jobs to the Philippines and India, and, and that's a community I personally lived in, you see the other side of the equation, the loss of the jobs. So suddenly, as he said before, Rose talks about the parallel community, the parallel economy that comes with it. They also lose clients. They also lose their social revenue. So it's really important to, to think about investment as a high quality investment. If you have a labor force, uh, I mean a human capital um, centered country such as we have, meaning education is one of our strengths, then we must look beyond just taking that nominal job, uh, agreeing to investments around the nominal job. And we must really start thinking about training around critical skills, training around analysis, training around health and science, because those are the, those will then in turn create your high value jobs. So the investment that can be, you know, it's, it's all great and fine to, to seek out investment, but I think it's more important to look at what does it mean for us five to 10 years from now? Is it a, an investment that will turn around? I mean, we all know how investors work. When it's time to pull out, there's absolutely no hesitation. 
So it's not just seeking investment, but looking at that high quality investment that has longevity. Thank you, Philip. Uh, and my last question to you, Raul. My last question to you, Raul, uh, is coming from a comment that was made earlier on in panel two by Otis, where we talked about the country grappling with issues of unemployment, foreign currency, power generation, etc., etc. How can BPO now? How can it address this for us as a short to medium term solution? Interesting. So, uh, the last line, short to medium term, is really, really important. And I'll again try to quote an example over here. Uh, in my previous comments, I mentioned that the turnaround time for the BPO industry to get the jobs is really, really quick. And uh, a few of the countries which did it, I know uh, uh, Fiji did it, I know Bangladesh did it. Uh, the size of the Bangladesh market in 27, BPO market in 27 was, uh, I think, 18, 90 million dollars or something like that. When I went back again uh, on a similar kind of event, they were talking about 300 million things. And 2019, I was not able to get there, but uh, the presentation that came back to me mentioned it as 520 or 520 million dollars. So in three years, the kind of investment which they did in, I think, 2014 and 2015, have started to pick up jobs, have started to uh, deliver the kind of dividends that they uh, uh, sort of. So there are uh, countries who have done it. There are case studies available who have done it uh, in, uh, to achieve their short and medium term goals in terms of employment. Now, uh, talking about uh, the entire ecosystem of um, uh, this BPO market, there are, uh, there are investors out there uh, who are looking for their shareholders value. And she said it absolutely right that they will pull the plug on the investment if the dividend, uh, the investment returns that they are getting on the investment are not uh, what they are expected to tell. They have 10 other countries to invest in. Why would they invest in the market? Right? So if the environment is not right, they are not getting the returns, they would uh, definitely not invest. On the other hand is government. Uh, government definitely, I have not seen a government who is not ready to spend on their people. They would definitely want to spend. The question is where, when, how, how do they judge where to spend? And whether BPO can be a part of it. Now, uh, why BPO can make an impact in the industry lies in the uh, skills and the demographic dividend itself that uh, my fellow uh, panelists spoke about. 70% uh, of the population less than 35 is a huge development and the kind of education that we already are on uh, gives us additional, um, uh, additional value to show to the investors. The right ecosystem, uh, the right uh, uh, right, uh, I should call it economic stability in terms of the currency fluctuations. Once that is done, that environment is created, I believe there is uh, there's, uh, good enough opportunity for Zimbabwe to create these short or medium term goals. Thank you, Raul. Uh, before we give um, Adolphus a chance to kind of wrap it up for us, we'll ask the floor for maybe two or three questions before we wrap it up. Do we have any questions for the panelists from the floor? Yes. Thank you so much. It's not so much a question as a uh, comment. This is the world that I live in, and it's creating impact source opportunities for you in South Africa to gain employment and employability. Um, both in your entry level positions as well as in your more higher order skill sets. Um, and in that space, of course, um, an accredited training provider who does that. And just to pick up on two of the comments in the previous session on this one, one of them was learn from the other countries' experiences. So, in terms of the experience that you had in South Africa with developing this level of skill set with, with the mindset of job creation, let's have a look at the case studies and what we've learned the hard way and not looking for lessons. <laughs> Um, there uh, are very many different ways and approaches to doing this, particularly now with ICT and the onset of digital learning platforms and actually the artificial intelligence and solutions in learning that you are speaking about in contact centers. So that's, that's quite key issue experiences, experiences there. The other quick comment was around the skill set that you're talking about developing for the first BPO sector. Is a skill set we all need to develop for future 4.0 in any event? 
So when we re-engage with government and do significantly um, on investment into the space of skills development, we are saying that the skills that you're developing here is not the any investment is making a large portion of the population, particularly youth employable, and it's even making a larger portion of the population in terms of those that have to be re-skilled and upskilled employable. And the technology is not the enemy, the ability to engage in the technology, the skills that you're talking about is key. So build that into the skills development strategy for the sector because if you look at all the customers you're servicing, it's cross-sector skills and they're going to multiply the impact for the economy and for your youth Thank you. Thank you, Tano. Um, my question is very good, Rahul. Um, I've come across uh, some, 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 some reports, UN uh, reports around um, impact sourcing in terms of the role that the UN agencies are playing in the world. I think one particular one is around um, digital jobs for women uh, and, and many other opportunities. I'm just keen to hear from you in terms of uh, your programs around that. How do you come into that whole picture to ensure that you provide that platform that enables uh, players to tap into you know, uh, the, the, the specific or special groups that could potentially be you know, uh, <coughs> onboarded for some of these as well in that program? Um, thanks for this for that. I think maybe I'll take that question together with uh, my, my wrap up and I think take a cue from her point that uh, I think I say that we are 100 years in 2019 and from now on, uh, that is from June when the Le Parliament of Labour globally meets, we have adopted what we call a human centered approach to, to the way we do business. And basically, I think one of the issues is to increase the uh, investment in people's capabilities. And I think it speaks to the issue of skills. Not skills for today, but skills for tomorrow. Uh, increase uh, investment in, in institutions of work. And I think one of the key issues that I had asked uh, my panel moderator was if there was a business member organization in this room and if there was a trade union representative in this room. So these are some of the things that I think would help these kind of discussions probably reach to the levels they need to reach in terms of policy. And also the other thing is to increase investments in, in this work. And I think the realization is that whether you like it or not, whether there is going to be technology, I don't know, maybe for some of those uh, tech geeks who say that in some years ahead there is going to rise a, a population of robots who will take over humans. But I think if you look today and you look tomorrow, there will still be people. In many other countries, in Africa at least for the next 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 years, I think, depending on the countries, the populations are going to be younger. In many European countries, the populations might be older. In many other countries, I think, uh, like uh, Japan, for example, I think there's probably some aging problems there. But it's still people at the end of the day that you need to serve. And I think if you look at Zimbabwe, demographics, I said 70% young people, 52% women, who are suffering in terms of you know, the challenges we face today. We might not be seeing the uh, impact, but we are seeing the challenges. It's women and young people. And I have to say that I think some of our programs, I'm not speaking here for the ILO only, but I'm also speaking now for the UN in Zimbabwe. We have used some of your platforms, you know, particularly I think those who are in mobile uh, network operators, to distribute some of our, you know, our funding and implement some of our programs. I think the cash transfer programs in Zimbabwe are based on the EcoCash, one uh, uh, telecash uh, platforms. So this is how we have adopted some of the technologies that we are seeing now to deliver some of our programs. Uptake and you know expansion sometimes again is limited because of access to infrastructure. If you you in us in the CBDs are uh, having 18 hours power cuts, you can imagine uh, grandmother at Jury Growth Point 
maybe seven days a week or even you know, a better part of the month. So these are issues that I was saying that as the minister is here, we might be developing all these ideas in this room. Broadly, as a government, we should deliberately target to create jobs. So not all investment is good. And this is why I was saying that in many other countries, I think including South Africa, the incentives are actually saying, how many jobs are you creating so that we can give you certain tax rebates? So this is a conversation that will not take place with Honorable Kazembe, but maybe with uh, Honorable Tuli, the Minister of Finance. So as a government, as a country, our macroeconomic policy should be reacting to some of these things. I know countries like South Africa, I think there's a BPO strategic development, Kenya is one, and I think some of the countries like Mauritius are also coming on board to develop specific strategies, but they also then have to feed into other macroeconomic policies in many other sectors. We're talking about women economic empowerment. So if women, when you look at the education and skills levels across the country, women and young people are the most unskilled, and they have the most limitations in terms of access. So I think these are all things that we need to look at, but I think we need to look at it in a much more broader you know, sense. And I think the agenda for those that are uh, in big corporates internationally is what we call now the Sustainable Development Goals. It's, we want to leave no one behind. And I think that really just tells you we need to continue to place people at the center of our innovation, at the center of our ideas. And the best way for the ILO to put people at the center of anything that you are doing is to create an opportunity to earn an income. That job gives purpose for a father, for a mother, for a community, for a country, and the globe as a whole. I think you can see, I'll give examples. If people don't have jobs, look how they behave. I think your social media is full, isn't it? Because people are saying they don't have? Exactly. So I, I, I can leave it at that. That is what we will see if we don't create jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will have to end here for the sake of time. But I'd like to thank you once again, Raoul, Philippa, and Adolphus. It was such an interesting discussion. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you.
We can engage customers in the service area with LCDs, mobile apps, and kiosks that you can program to deliver targeted content and offers based on your knowledge of a particular service area specific traffic patterns. Not only does this provide your customers with a more positive brand experience, it provides you with the opportunity to increase revenues by cross-selling other products and services. And then we utilize real-time feedback mechanisms to help your brand by broadcasting customer experiences to the major social media channels. And, along with the Q management system data, help you make decisions on how to improve the customer experience. With solutions like the mobile app that allows customers to take a nap of water and route, WaveTech continues to provide innovative customer management solutions that over 1 billion people a year interact with. We help several of the world's leading banks, healthcare, retail, and telco companies, government agencies, and airlines improve their customer experiences. And we'd like to help yours. We can even provide consultancy services to make sure your company offers the best in-person customer experience possible. Call us to schedule a demo of WaveTech's customer management solutions today. In the heart of Southern Africa, Harare, Zimbabwe's capital, is where you will find us. Omnicontact. Today is the age of information and successful companies understand the importance of global connectivity. The ability to service and market with a very diverse customer base from all corners of the earth. Omnicontact specializes in giving you a seamless customer support solution, such as running cost-effective customer acquisition campaigns, providing key customer insights for strategic decision making and leveraging our technology to enhance your customer's experience. We are the experts. Our customer experience consultants have undertaken hundreds of CX programs, trained thousands of people and designed great customer experiences that fuel companies. We know how to move your organization to the next level. Only Contact is the partner that provides you with a universal solution only contact seamless customer experience management. Thank you once again to our sponsors Net One, Tel One, Stewart Bank, Chartered Institute of Customer Management, Econet Wireless, Ameo, Tech 24, Cassava Smart Tech, Omni Contact, and our host Cars. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon the Cars Vice President. Mr. Spencer Mangua, to come and introduce to us our guest of honor.
I said to him, um, I know a bit about you, so I'm going to keep the little garden very short. So I'll try and do that. Our guest of honor is um, a chartered electrical engineer. He also holds a qualification in data communication and networking. He's got a BTEC in CCTV and surveillance from Tapcom in the United Kingdom. He also has a Bachelor of Technology in Marketing from the University of South Africa. He currently holds a Diploma in Electronics from the ETAP 